welcome back. Okay, it's week three of our study on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And quick recap, we have covered the supremacy of love. That was verses one and two. And then we have started with verses three and four last week. Let me see what I wrote down as our subtitle there on um, <clears throat> the description of love. So we talked about things that love does, the actions that love takes, and then we started talking about things that love is not. So we got through a few of those, and we have a few more to do tonight. So we'll start in verse five. Um, for those of you who are catching this on YouTube, um, I su highly suggest you go back and find the first couple weeks because we really cover the history of who the Corinthians were. And it kind of lays the groundwork for where we are now. But let's go on with our description of love. In verse five, it's continuing the sentence from verse four. It says, love does not act unbecomingly. It's what the New American Standard says. King James says, love does not behave rudely. NIV says, love is not rude. So, we want to, when we think of love, we think of kindness and good manners. We think of chivalry and that for a lot of um, women, we think of that fairy tale prince coming in when we think of love. Um, but we think, you know, love treats people with respect, right? Yeah. That's one of the, the ground rules that we come up with. Love, you respect me if you love me. So it's kindness and good manners. It's not this stuffy, oh, you've got to do things just this way and hold your pinky up when you drink your tea. Not that kind of manners. It's about treating each other with respect. You know, people who love you do not behave rudely. Love does not behave rudely. And I think we are talking about love as Christians and how we show love because it's the most excellent way when someone comes into your church, I'm going to go to, and Larry's not here, Debbie, but I am going to go ahead and use this example of someone who's homeless who comes in or someone who comes in covered in tattoos. What is our reaction to them? It's not only do we snub them, which is what I think we talked about before, or don't reach out to them, but do we actually act rude towards them? Do we turn up our nose? Do we make snide comments about the way they smell, look, or dress? Some do. Some, Some do. people do, yeah. Um, you know, I've probably been guilty of that myself. Whether I said it out loud or thought it in my head, thinking, wow. oh, um, I, well, I will, I'm going to out myself. For a second. <laughs> when Dave and I were, um, well, Dave was the evangelism minister, I think was his official, official title, but basically he was the outreach pastor at a church that had once upon a time been suburban Nashville, but with urban sprawl, we were now in the heart of urban Nashville. It had spread our way um, Dave would drive the church van to go pick up kids, part of his ministry, right? He's outreach minister. And he would be flashed by prostitutes less than a block from the church, wanting him to, I mean, literally flash, showing them everything, trying to get them to pull over. This is the neighborhood we lived in. We had to have a gate at the end of the church driveway because Otherwise, people would drive into the church parking lot, which was behind the church, and there would be drug deals going on, or there would be the prostitutes would bring their johns back there, or sometimes it was just kids being stupid, but we lived behind the church, and there was gated yard and stuff, and then big grassy area, and then the church parking lot. So... If we always knew when someone forgot to lock that gate because we could see <laughs> what was in the parking lot. When, and when you have children, three children, 
under the age of five, it's not a very comfortable feeling. Right. Um, but Dave also, because we were that close, he didn't drive to the church to go sit in the office unless he was going visiting or somewhere, something. There was no reason to drive the car all the way around the big city block to get into the church parking lot. So we would walk, you know, through the yard and across. And one morning, Dave was walking across and there was a homeless man laying across the step at the entrance to the church. He had on a um, white painter's coverall that had, that was quite ripped, torn, stained. Um, to the point at one point after he had come into we the church kind of took him under their wing we had to go buy him underwear because of where the holes were they were strategically placed <clears throat> where he had worn so we had to go buy him some new underwear to make him appropriate um well not appropriate but to make him modest to be into the church this man would talk your ear off he did not make sense. Through the ministry to this man, we discovered that he had a daughter. Our pastor's wife worked as, as the church secretary, and she got him in there one morning, one day, and they called his daughter. She was able to find the phone number. They called her, and the daughter was so relieved because he was off his medication, and that's why he was now homeless. And the church did minister with him, to him, for him, and helped him get back on meds, helped him um, with hygiene, helped him with all these things. But <clears throat> he came into church service, into our worship morning worship service, probably the first week, maybe the second week within our involvement with him. And I can remember looking at him. I'd heard the description. I hadn't been at the church office because I was working somewhere else, but I'd heard a description about him. And, I, you know, but I will admit that it would not have been hard for me to make a, a rude comment to him because of the way he was dressed, because of the way he smelled. And I didn't know his story at that point. And I do believe there probably were people in our church who did make those rude comments to him. But that man in the middle of service stood up and this is what we will always remember him for. And so that's what this reading this chapter reminds me of him because love was what he brought to us. He reminded us about love. He um, stood up in the middle of a service and I don't even know what was going on. And I really believe now that somebody probably said something to him before the church service, but he stood up in the middle of the church service and was yelling, love my neighbor. And then he begins to quote scripture, uh, you know, that this is the greatest command and this kind of thing, you know, just going through. And it wasn't exactly accurate, but he was a reminder to us that we are to love each other. But he is my visual reminder of love is not rude. Yeah. Because it would have been so easy to be rude to that man because of the way he looked, because of the way he smelled, because he was legitimately and certifiably not sane because he was off of his medication. He had a mental illness. It would have been so easy to be rude, but love is not rude. Love does not act unbecomingly. It's not just about putting on a good show of how to act. It's about treating each other with respect. I think that's where I keep coming back to it. Respecting people because they're people and they're God's children. But that there is sometimes the problem. People don't know what respect means. I, yeah. Right. It's because we don't teach it in our culture anymore. Yeah. 
We don't teach it. We teach to be all about oneself and self-awareness, self-care, all of that is very good and noble things. But the Bible tells us to deny ourselves and to take up the cross daily. And that is where you learn respect is by denying yourself in favor of your brother or your sister. Not at the point that you're a doormat, but in love. All right. So that is love does not behave rudely. The next part of this verse says it does not seek its own. Love does not seek its own. Um, what do I don't remember. Um, sorry, I'm a little off tonight. Love does not seek its own. Love doesn't look for kudos, so to speak. It doesn't want to just be like, oh, well, I know you got my back and you're gonna pat me on the back. So you're part of my group. If you remember, we talked about um, Paul was addressing the fact that there were cliques within the church. There were, and they thought that this group that had this spiritual gift thought they were better than this group that had this spiritual gift or this group that were the socialites of town thought they were better than this group who were maybe Jewish converts. You know, there was all of that. The, the free slave may not may have had been looked down upon by somebody who was a slave owner. That is what the Corinthian church was. They had all these cliques and he's saying, you don't seek your own. He also addressed this in Romans Imagine that, another uh, church that he dealt with. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. And he says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. So it's, to, it's this whole idea of where we say we give honor to people just because they're our brother, they're our sister. We give them, it comes back to that respect in a way. We lift them up. We are devoted to each other in this idea of the brotherly love, the um, the fact that we can't look past ourselves or to those who look like us and act like us and talk like us limits how we love others if you also look in philippians chapter 2 verse 4 it says yet again paul let each of you look out not only for his own interest but also for the interest of others this is that what would jesus do in the most basic of ways jesus was not self-centered he was other centered he was always looking for others to be a love other center person is to follow Christ and to follow his example. It's that whole idea that we talked about a couple of weeks ago when, you know, I tell my child every morning when we, when I pray with Audrey, when I drop her off at school, every morning, one of the things we say is you're going to be Jesus with, and she always replies skin on because she knows that she's the Jesus that others see and she has to treat others the way that Jesus would teach them, would treat them. It's, we, I think a lot of this is in our westernized American culture and this whole idea of, I'm gonna pull myself up on my bootstraps and I can do it and we can make it and anybody can make it. Yeah, anybody can make it, but if somebody doesn't make it, we look down on them. This whole, it's self-centered and that we are, I think the word is egocentric. We believe that we can do it and we can do it all by ourselves and we don't need each other. And we lose this concept of fellowship, which is the brotherly love. Right. That, that's what gets hit here is love does not seek its own, but love instead is part of the fellowship 
that you welcome all in and that everyone is welcome and loved. And there are people through the years that through the church I am friends with and know intimate details of their lives and they know intimate details of my life. But outside of the, the fellowship, I probably wouldn't have crossed paths with them. And my life is so much richer for knowing these people. I want to read this quote from, um, from this commentary. It says, love is never satisfied, but in the welfare, comfort, and salvation of all. That man is no, that man is no Christian who is solicitous for his own happiness alone. Man's, what he's saying is man's not a Christian if he's only worried about his own happiness and nobody else's. It says, and cares not how the world goes as long as he himself be comfortable. Think about that. If we are so self-centered that we're only worried about our comfort and what makes us happy and what makes us feel good, then how can we reach out to others? How can we minister with God's love, how can we reach out and be that Jesus of skin on if we are only focused on ourselves? It's a hard thing. It's a hard thing for us, especially, and let's just be it, white Americans in the deep South. Is that not what we are? It's hard for us to say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. You know. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. You know, let's, let's look at me. It's hard for us to put that aside because we're so used to being catered to. I had to laugh and I'm going to tell a story. And if Caitlin watches this, sorry, Caitlin, I got to tell the story. Um, she has been staying with us the last few weeks and on her way to work, we've been carpooling and I, she wants to stop at those um, nutrition places. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The places with the loaded teas. Mm -hmm. And she has to stop and she's got these sleeve covers that go over her cups so that they look pretty and cute when she takes them into work. All of this stuff. And it just cracks me up because I watch, I sat in the parking lot the other morning while she was running in and getting her tea. And I watch these women, they're primarily women who stop for those things. Women that I have worked with in different facets of our life in the past 10 years. And they stop, they're at their car, they have to smooth their hair, make sure that everything looks just right. At six o'clock in the morning, they have, to, they have to make sure everything looks just right at six o'clock in the morning to go in and pick up that tea, just in case they take their picture and put it on social media. <laughs> I promise you that's what they're doing. We are so... We You're look, a loser. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Debbie asked if she lost me, but um, Debbie's the one frozen on my end. There you are. Y'all were frozen on my end. <laughs> wow. I could hear. Uh, <laughs> okay, hold on just a second. I got to reply to this. Okay. Work's trying to call me in, and I've already scheduled for that time. So, <laughs> um, we get so focused on our on that on on this whole con idea of how we look what we look like um oh somebody might take my picture and put it on social media we've even let's just be honest i've got youtube here with me and yes it's still on youtube so you don't have to be too honest but i'm gonna be honest we get on and we talk up just for a few minutes before we start the recording and we fuss about what the way we look and do we look too tired to be on video right we are worried about our image. We we're are. worried about ourselves. But love does not seek its own. Love doesn't look out for itself. 
love looks out for others. What an amazing concept that is. I watch and I work with some of the most amazing women you would ever meet. But, and if you would see them out in public when, we're go when we go out for dinner or anything like that, um, they are dressed to the nines type people. You know, they have their hair just perfect. They have their nails done. They've got the makeup on. Their clothes are real nice. But when we come rolling in there to work with those kids, it's that messy bun and um, trying to drink coffee just to wake up because we're, you know, we, we're dragging scrubs and a t-shirt. That's what we look like. And I think about that, it's not, to me, that's kind of the image I get when we think about ourselves versus the needs of others. Right. It's not about, I, and I'm not even talking about our personalities or anything. I'm just, the, that, that visual of, okay, I'm dressed up to go out to eat for a company dinner with everybody versus I'm here to work with these kids and I got my hair up and I've got no makeup on and I'm chugging the coffee to be asleep. You know, so that I don't go to sleep and I've got scrubs on. I don't chug coffee. I don't like coffee, but <laughs> just that visual is what I get. What's keep me self-centered? Our world has become a me, me, me world. Everything is focused on me, on mm -hmm. you know, everything. And a lot of people don't know how to focus on others. They don't know how to see what the other person needs. And do you think that's because they were never taught to look past themselves? Maybe part of it. I, I'm going to use another comparison from my work life. I mean, I think that might be part of it because if you're raised, and I don't want to say raised, but if you're brought up by your parents to respect others, to sh show others that you care for them, that you love them. I honestly believe that that will carry over in your adulthood. But if you're raised or brought up to be selfish and um, everything's got to be your way, then I believe that that's how you're going to be as an adult. Mm -hmm. unless you're taught otherwise well I also think about the generation we have now that's growing up yes they are and it's a lot of this self-awareness which is a good thing in and of itself but it needs to be taught in a different way they are being taught so many of them come out of what's being taught with this idea that everybody's against me mm -hmm. i never do anything wrong and if i do do something wrong is because somebody did something to me previously now are there truths and all that yes there are people who truly have experienced horrific traumas that, that cause reaction within them and basically PTSD reactions and those yeah. types of things. Trauma does do that. Yes, it does. But not every person has experienced the level of trauma that would excuse a behavior sometimes. This, this, I can't do anything wrong attitude.
I'm trying to think how to word this. It's just so, I, you, I watch, I have young adult children. I have, um, and I still have a elementary school age child. So right. I have elementary, college age, and then young adult career. And I've watched little by little as they're going through my children, what they're being taught. Compassion for others is a criteria. That's what we're talking about with love. Love is compassion. Compassion is love. True love is compassion. Let's put it that way. Um, but to go from compassion to this whole idea that everybody's right. Nobody can ever be wrong. It takes away, it takes away, it makes us this self-centered person instead of others focused. Because you have to be strong in and of yourself to be others focused. But you have to learn that balance. And I don't think we teach our children that balance. Yeah. I know my older children with us in the food pantry at one of the churches we pastor, and they were carrying at five and six years old, they were trying to carry the groceries to the car for people because, and they'd be there, we'd pack up the groceries, we'd get the donations. And for example, a birthday cake would come in because Food City had made one with the wrong words or something. And they'd be like, oh, it's so-and-so's birthday. They would know. They knew whose birthday it was of those people because they talked to them and they cared to learn about these people. That's at five and six years old. But yet I know adults now who wouldn't think that far out and wouldn't think about, oh, who could use this? Oh, oh, this would be a blessing to this person. Right. It's, it's that we've got to teach We've got to teach ourselves and we have to teach our children and we have to teach their children. Yes. That the focus isn't on me. That the gospel is not all about me. Yes, Jesus is a, is a personal salvation and Jesus is my personal savior. He died for me. But he also died for you. Absolutely. And he died for that person standing on the corner begging. And he died for that drug addict laying over there in the hospital dying. Yes. It's for all yes it's personal but it's also for all and it doesn't mean that it ends when i receive salvation then my job is to bring it to everybody else all right i don't think you guys are going to like this next one don't <laughs> it says love we're still talking about love is not provoked have you ever been provoked? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> How many of you are honest enough to say you probably get close to being provoked almost every day? Oh, yeah. <laughs> depends on your job. Depends on your exactly. family. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I know some people who get provoked with nobody. You would think they were the calmest person until you turn on the news. And then they get provoked. We find it kind of easy to be provoked or to be irritated with someone who's just plain annoying, right? That right. person just annoys me, get them away. Hmm. But let me tell you a story about a man named Moses. And what happened to him? He got provoked. Go back to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20, verse 2 through 11, specific. It says, there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron. Thus, the people thus contended with Moses and spoke, saying, if only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why then have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our beasts to die here? Why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us in this wretched place? And it's not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is it to drink. 
okay? So the nation of Israel, wandering in the desert, are grumbling. Surprise, surprise. A group of people are grumbling against their leaders. Yeah. Blaming them for everything that's wrong. Then Moses and Aaron came in from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Okay? Godly, these are godly leaders who are seeking after God. He says the glory of God appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock and let the congregation in their beast drink. The roses took, Moses took the rock from before the Lord, just as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered around the assembly before the rock, and he said to them, Listen now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? You hear the attitude? Yeah. Okay. And Moses and Aaron had gotten very provoked by that congregation. We know for a fact Moses was because of this right here. That he had that little bit of an attitude. What? Fine. You want water? God said we give you water. And it says, then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And wait a second. Is that what God told him to do? No, he told him to speak. Right. Now, in the past, Moses had struck the rock. Right. when God told him to, and it brought forth fresh water. This time, God tells him to speak. Now, I have to wonder. It says water came forth abundantly in the congregation and their beast drank. But I have to wonder, why did Moses strike the rock instead of speaking to it? Now, I've heard sermons my entire life saying, that Moses just thought he knew better because God had done it this way before. So we're going to do it this way again. And I've always thought that. But look at it this way. He was mad. He was mad. He was mad. And he wanted to hit something. Yeah. He wanted to prove his point. And what he didn't even fully listen to what God told him to do. He grabbed that rod and was like, oh, okay, this is what I did before. Run, rebel, bang, bang, bang. And then they have water. But yeah. that's not what I told him to do. If he had not been so provoked or so angry and irritated with the people, he would have heard God. Yeah. God disciplined Moses for this single action. If you read on through ver um, verse 12, verse 12 says, but the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. God did not let Moses enter the promised land. That was, that was the plan all along, wasn't it? Moses would lead them into the promised land, land, not lead them to the edge of the promised land. The plan, what he, his, his job he'd been given was to lead them into the promised land. But then God said, nope. <coughs> You're going to be disciplined. Why did God discipline? First of all, a lot of times it's sin, isn't it? So when we look at this, God's disciplining him for being provoked. Hey, babe. If God's disciplining him for being provoked, does that mean that him being provoked and irritated to the point of not listening to God? Okay, we are, I'm not saying that you got a little annoyed with this person. And so I'm saying to the point that you can't hear God, you're that provoked, you're that irritated. Is that a sin? I believe so. It's a hard pill to swallow sometimes, though, isn't it? Right. <laughs> yep. It is. It's a hard pill to swallow. Moses lost the opportunity to enter the problem because he got so annoyed with the people and irritated with the people that he was sent to. Yeah. 
Yeah. We are all meant to Base it, at the basics of Christianity, we are all sent to serve the sinful world to bring them to God, right? Right. Mm-hmm. How annoyed do we get and irritated? Mm-hmm. Those who are living in sin, how annoyed and irritated do we get with their sin? Mm-hmm. Doesn't even have to be somebody you know personally. How annoyed and irritated do we get when we see something on the news that we know is against the word of God? Do we get so provoked that we can no longer hear God's voice telling us what to do in that instance? Very possible. That's... that's Kind of a bitter pill to take. It, you know, hard pill to swallow. Bitter, bitter herbs to eat. Do I get so upset and offended and provoked and angry and annoyed that people just won't listen to the word of God when it's right there in front of you that I miss what God is telling me to do for those people? Right. When you become passion, let, let's remember the word of God. Bay comes from. The same root word as agony. agony. So full of passion, right? So think about that. Those things that annoy you, those things that you become passionate about is where God wants to use you. But if you allow that passion to become pro- provocation and you're angry and you're annoyed, and irritated, and you no longer hear God, then the passion is misused. You can't use that agape love to follow God's plan for you. What is your purpose? What is your call? So many of us question God for that, but yet that passion, we're so angry about something. Maybe instead of being angry, we can be passionate about it and have God listen to God speak to us as to what we can do to make a difference. And it may just be a difference for one person. It may be a different, but are we going to miss it? We're so provoked and irritated and annoyed that we miss the voice of God. We got some serious. <laughs> and I think that happens a lot when people like you were referring to the news, they get provoked, but then they hang on to that. They don't let it go. And the longer they hang on to it, I believe that's the further away they get from hearing God because their ears are shut and their mouths are open. And so until they back away and realize what's happening, that's a lot of it's acknowledging that you've allowed that to take over you, the anger and the irritation and the frustration. Yeah. I don't even the news anymore because of that fact. I've not listened to it in a long time because it does make me angry. It does. It can really make us angry. Um, I, I have a degree in history and political science. I look at them repeating mistakes of the past and want to scream and yell at our leaders who are making these decisions. Right. But that's not where I am to be right now. And it's hard. I I I don't I I watch the news, I read the I read the news, I don't read a newspaper anymore. I usually read online, but and I do research. But I have to draw a line for myself Mm -hmm. so that I can keep my head level and not become so intense and so annoyed, so irritated and angry, provoked, that I miss hearing the voice of God in my own life. It's just, I mean... 
to be provoked can cause you to your promised land. Would you want to be Moses and realize that you miss going into the promised land because you acted in anger, not towards God and not anything that was even, you know, harmful to anybody because they still got water, right? But because you miss listening to God, you miss the promised land. That happens a lot today. It does happen a lot today. Um, I, I'll just be honest. I'm, unfortunately, due to social media, we can all see things. <laughs> Family dramas that I would prefer not to see. And I've seen three things in the past 48 hours of some ministry families that are close to us. They're just breaking my heart. And it's because they are becoming so provoked over things that they are missing out on where God is leading them right now. They can't hear the voice of God over their anger. Yeah. And how can you love when you're provoked? Exactly. Think about when you discipline your children. You know, that was one rule of thumb I was always taught from my parents. And then even in, as a young mother, was don't discipline your children when you're mad. When you're angry. When you're angry, you go mm -hmm. and, you and then come back and to have the talk and the discipline and whatever mm -hmm. punishment. Right. Don't react. Do not react. And that's true. And the times that I have reacted are the things that haunt me and I regret. Great. Parker. Oh, hi, puppies. That's Parker. Hi, Parker. <laughs> Get the Bible in, Parker. <laughs> He's trying. All right. Let's move on. We're going to finish. We got two more parts of verse six. I at least want to get through verse six. I told you we would get to verses five and six. That's where we're at. Verse six. The next part is love thinks no evil. Now, we just read that and kind of go over it. But do you know what this literally means? A literal translation from the Greek means love does not store up the memory of any wrong it has received. Mm. Love's going to put away the hurts of the past that are clinging onto them. That's such a hard thing to do. And we are, I do a lot of them um, with, with job and with ministry. I do a lot of trauma training on how to talk with, to people who have experienced traumas. And one of the things is that you, you, they talk about how it has this scientifically trauma as a residual, has a residual effect on your brain. Right. That can last your entire lifetime that can be overcome but there's healing the healing process is long and slow and so these people who have suffered intense traumas they have literally stored the memory of that evil that was done against them in their brain mm -hmm. it's in their nervous it affects them completely And they have to, they keep clinging on to it because it's embedded into their chemistry now, their body chemistry. So how do we change that? It's the love of Christ. It's the only thing. There's no magic medicine that'll fix that. There's no magic psychology or psychiatry that can correct that. There's not a button we can push or a little prescription that can be written. It's, it's got to be done with love and compassion. That love stores no memory of any wrong it has received. It is so hard. There is this story that 
is written here. It's, it says one writer tells of a tribe in Polynesia where it was customary for each man to keep some reminders of his hatred for others. These reminders were suspended from the roofs of their huts to keep alive the, the wrongs, real or imagined. Could you imagine if instead we harbor it in our hearts and in our minds and it, it just becomes part of us? I talked about, you know, when I, when I taught, preached a couple weeks ago on the book of Job, talked about how stress and trauma and all those things that come against us can cause us to become physically ill. Right. It can cause us to become physically ill because we hold on to it. Right. When something happens to you, are you able to just say, okay, my mom used to say it, my niece to say that my sister coined it, but I know it came from our mother. <laughs> and I know she got it from somewhere else. But the things have to come, you have to let things go like duck off of, like water off a duck's back. Wow. Okay. I walk around and tell my children, quack, quack, when they get stressed out. They get a little aggravated with me. But that's what I'll tell them, quack, quack. Because it, you have to be like a duck. Well, how can you be like a duck? How many of us truly let that stress roll off? I can tell you, I don't. Not right away. That stress becomes part of me until I can get into my prayer closet and give it to God. Wow. And if I don't take the time out to really spend time with God and letting him take it all. And I'm not talking a little 30 second, God, take this. I can't handle it. I yeah, mean, it's pouring it out. If I don't take that time, I start to become physically ill. Now imagine, and we, we, we understand that of being ill, but imagine instead that we were like this Polynesian tribe. That person cut me off in traffic today. Am I going to go hang a little picture of a car up on, outside my house? that person stole my lunch out of the refrigerator am i going to go hang up a to-go container on outside my house you guys are chuckling and smiling but think about it that's what they were doing if we don't physically hang those things out but we're hanging them in our minds we're hanging them right. in our hearts it makes us ill physically ill but it also inhibits our ability to love the way that god intends for us to love because we're holding on to those wrongs. When someone has truly wronged me and they give me a true apology, what am I supposed to do with that? Am I supposed to do, am I supposed to forgive it but hold it over their heads for the rest of their life? That's not forgiveness. Nope. If they truly have asked for forgiveness, you have to give that forgiveness. Mm -hmm. But God says that we're supposed to forgive anyway. We right. have to. So, you know. And why, we, why do you and, think? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> and, and you don't keep bringing it up to them. Right. When you they ask you for forgiveness and you truly do it, you've got to let it go and not keep bringing it up every time somebody makes you angry. True. So why do you think God tells us to forgive anyway? We, we've heard sermons, we've heard counselors tell us that forgiving is for us and not for the person that we forgive. But why? Because it destroys you. Okay. I mean, it, it destroys you from the inside out. It's, it, it, it just, it destroys you. It does. And when we look at this, when we look here in this definition of what love is, what love is not, love does not think evil. It doesn't hold on to those wrong. Right. Real love never supposes that a good action may have a bad motive. This is really hard. When someone has hurt you, you know, we, we all heard the, the saying, once bitten, twice shy, right? If someone hurts you once, you're going to be careful the next time. You didn't, they don't have to trust again. But the right. Bible tells you the opposite. Mm -hmm. 
It says, don't hold on to that. One. Don't assume that when they do something good for you, that they've got an ulterior motive. Right. Oh, it's so hard to trust, especially when you've been burned, isn't it? It is. Yes. It is very hard to trust, especially when they're like that. If they've done something wrong to you or hurt you, it is really, really hard to let it go and trust. It is. It's very hard to let it go and trust. But if we're walking in the most excellent way, that we're walking in God's love and we are God's love. Yes. We're able to do that. I, I just, I think when we pray and let, let's be honest, some of us in this class, some who aren't here tonight as well, have made a comment that their prayer, they feel impressed by the spirit to pray that their prayer would be to love others the way that Christ loves them or to see others the way that you see right. them. Right. Are we willing to do that if it means we can't hold on to those hurt? And if it means risking that we're going to be hurt again? Good question. Love is the most excellent way. This is, this is kind of funny because um, me and Tiffany <laughs> had a discussion about this today, about trusting and loving people and how we're supposed to love like God loves. And she said, but mama, I'm tired of being hurt. And I said, but Tiffany, I said, there's hurt everywhere you have to let go and let God teach you and if you let go of that hurt and learn to trust again God will take care of it I'm going to show her this and I'm going to let her <laughs> watch this video because she really really we discussed this for probably an hour today it's hard. It's not easy. No, it's not. It's not easy. Um, there are there are people in my life. There are people in family's life mm -hmm. that, and it, it's part of our ministry life that hurt us so deeply. Oh yeah. And I see them frequently in the grocery store. It was unique this last church we passed because we didn't leave the area. We before we'd always you 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 go and then you move on somewhere else so you could forgive because you're not seeing those people again the ones that hurt yeah. you. We didn't do that this time. We've stayed here. And I see them at the grocery store. Facebook now, they're still there. Whereas before you could lose contact. You're on Facebook, you can't lose contact with anybody. Um, and that hurt comes up every time I see them. And not necessarily hurt for myself, right. but hurt for my children. Yes. Hurt for my husband. Hurt for those members of our church family that got caught in the crossfire. Mm -hmm. and, I, and you know, for, for myself and, and Dave and I've talked about this, this concept right here about not letting, not storing up the memory of the wrongs. It means we have to be willing for ministry's sake, and it doesn't matter what our ministry is at this point in our lives, but in order for us to function as God has called us to function, we have to be able to not store those wrongs. Right. Not we even the memory. Yeah. You said let it go. I got to tell you, when Audrey was probably about, she was about three years old, two or three, when 
Frozen came out. Oh, yes. <laughs> but I want to tell you, my little church baby, she went, didn't sing Let It Go completely from the movie. She was walk around the house with her hands up in the air and she would sing, let it go, let it go. Praise God. Praise God. Right. Such a deep and powerful message. We have to, that's what this love thinks no evil means. We have to let it go and just continue to praise God. And be vulnerable enough for God to use us with the next person who might do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agape love is agony. I mean, I can't get over that. You know, that, that's, that's what keeps coming back to my mind. It feels like agony sometimes. Yeah. But it's the same root word. It's from the passion. The passion that we have for God, so therefore we have for his people. The passion that we have to do what he has created each of us to do and to be who he's created us to be. Sometimes it causes deep pain. Love's not always easy. But it, we are to think no evil. Yeah. And here is the other thing. Hmm. This is the rest of verse six. And I want to read, I've got it chopped up here. So let me read it here. But actually, this is verse six. Every, we did up to this point, verse five. Verse six. Five. What was that? Okay. <laughs> it says, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. King James says, love does not rejoice in iniquity. When your brother falls, when your sister falls, love does not rejoice in their failure. That's right. It doesn't rejoice in their moral failure. You want, love wants what's best for others. Love refuses to take these things and make it against somebody else. Right. We would, it does us good to remember there are always two sides to every story. And somewhere in the middle is the truth. Right. Uh -huh. love rejoices in the truth love can always stand with and on the truth because love is pure and good like the truth so let's think about that love does not rejoice in the failures of others it does not rejoice in the sins of others it doesn't say oh look at you you thought you were so good but ha ha i caught you and we do that, especially if it's someone that we haven't let go of that memory of what they did to us. It all goes together. Instead, love rejoices in the truth. That same person that you're watching struggle, what's the truth about them? It could be that they have a talent for listening to others that you never have. They could have that gift to be able to sit and listen. They, it could be that, what, what's the other truth? The truth could be that this is a false accusation against them and we need to recognize. Love rejoices in the truth and the truth will be seen. Any comments? Nope. Nope. No comments. Nope. Nope. All right. I'm hearing dogs in the other room. I'm sorry. That's why I keep looking for. Um, I think we only got through verse six. Two more verses. That seems to be our pattern. But I think that's where we're going to end tonight because I don't want to get started into verse seven because it's, uh -uh. it's pretty in depth conversation so we'll save that one for next week yeah before we close and i know we always close in prayer 
And we do a lot of chit chat before we start recording about some prayer requests. But is there anything specific that you want to pray for tonight? Just my family. We really need it. Okay. I think I want to. I want to remember our church. Yes. All, three of us keep, that are on this particular recording all work in different aspects of the church, different places. But I really have a burden right now, and Debbie and I have talked about this one for our children and our youth. Yeah, I've asked for prayer for the, our youth Tuesday night at that Bible study. This is, there's so much war, spiritual warfare going on there that yeah. even our leaders need to be aware and they're even getting attacked yeah but yeah we we've got to pray for them yeah me and tiffany was kind of talking about that a little bit um <laughs> we were talking about spiritual warfare a little bit she's been having some dreams and i believe that some of the dreams that she's having is spiritual dreams Mm -hmm. and i'm not going to go into any detail right now but That's okay. um, i tried to explain to her about it she's she's really unsure about but we just we had a long talk today and she's confused about some things she doesn't understand she doesn't understand what God is calling her to. She said, I know that he's calling me to something, Mama. I just don't know what. But Satan is fighting her, and he's fighting her hard. And it's not just her. It's, it's all of our children. It's all of them. Yeah. It is. All right. Debbie, are you up to praying tonight? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to the conclusion of this tonight's Bible study, Father, I thank you because your word is opened up and help us to see just how we are supposed to love others and how we are to let it go <laughs> and to not hold on to the things when we have been hurt or when we have been betrayed by others. But Father, it must be that we search our hearts and we allow you to completely cleanse out every bit of even the memory of the things that have been done so that we can truly reach out and love the others. And Father, we come to you tonight on behalf of our youth and our children. And Father, we ask you, Lord Jesus, to cover them with your blood, and to surround them with your angels and your hedge of protection, God, to help them to be able to stand against the attacks that are coming against them and to touch our leaders, God, and help them to see and to understand and to be led by you in the way, God, that you would have them to lead our youth. And Lord, I ask you to not to touch Amanda in a special way. She has opened up our eyes to see your word, Father, as she unfolds each week. And I ask you to continue to anoint her, Father, and open up our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to apply those things that you are teaching us. And Father, I thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to message for anybody who is watching on YouTube. I highly suggest you go back and catch the first two weeks of this if you have not. And if you are in our local area, please come visit us at Mount Vale. We would love to see you. Yes, yes we would. Yes, definitely.